very good afternoon to you. A warm welcome uh, to people in the room and to those who are watching on the stream. The issue we're talking about now is responding to the Great Resignation. Now, that, of course, assumes that there was a Great Resignation to start with. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to be presumptuous and believe that some of the panel may even challenge that very question. And they were told that over four million people were quitting their jobs in the United States every month at the end of last year. And that was more than ever before. Well, if they were all quitting their jobs, what were they doing and where were they going and why? And even if it did happen, how do, how do policymakers and companies respond? Well, we have a perfect panel to discuss this, and we'll be taking some questions from you in the room as we work our way through. It's not the most... Uh, do forgive me. <laughs> nice to have you with us. <laughs> we have Sharon Murray, the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. Sharon, it is good to have you here. Alain de Hayes is the Chief Executive Officer of the ADECO Group. Uh, nice to have you. Levan Kagurarolu is the Chief Executive Officer CEO of Koch Holdings from Turkey, sir. You're most welcome. And the Governor of Maryland from the US, Governor Hogan. It is nice to have you, sir, Thank you. Uh, with us. Um, the Great Resignation. First of all, do you accept that there was a Great Resignation? No. I think it's a myth. Because if you look at the... US Bureau of Statistics, then what it shows is people actually did swap jobs. There's no doubt about that. But in the US, you didn't do what Europe did or Australia did because millions of people lost their jobs overnight, within a day or two of COVID, whereas the, the arrangements with social protection, with short-term working hours, et cetera, kept people in jobs in other countries. But the theory was, I think the idea underlying the Great Resignation, is that either people had had enough or they wanted to do something else or they were going to move somewhere else and basically they, they just were not going to put up with the corporate crap. Well, that's a really good theory that I could buy into. But actually, what really was happening is, if you look at pre-pandemic, you had 4% transfer of jobs. It went up in leisure and hospitality and retail, I think, with the three big sectors, by about 2%. Now, that's because people were offered a little more wage or a little more security. And that's fair enough. People do change jobs. I admit that there's a lot of job... Uh, there's a lot of tension and dissatisfaction. But I don't think you can say it's a great resignation, except potentially in the tech sector and the high-level paying jobs. So it's a myth. Do you agree? Uh, as a matter of fact, there was an article uh, on uh, Harvard Business Review in March arguing that uh, this was a linear trend starting in 2009. And uh, because of the COVID in 2020, there was a decline. And in 2021, it was a catch up on the previous year. And the picture is different in different markets, including the emerging uh, markets where the job security is more, uh, much more uh, concern. So within your company, did you notice people leaving, changing, moving? Uh, in, in our company, uh, where we have 110,000 colleagues, uh, it has not been the case. As a matter of fact, in the last seven years, the voluntary uh, leave uh, ratio has declined. Although we have seen uh, some of our colleagues leaving, especially in the IT uh, sector. Uh, now, are they leaving to go to other jobs? Are they leaving because they've been poached by other employers? They have been poached by other employees from uh, companies in Europe, in the US, because uh, they are being offered much higher salaries in those countries. That is the reason. And that's a problem for you? Uh, that is not a big problem at the moment. It may become a problem for us. Well, so far, two people say that the very purpose of our discussion is irrelevant. <laughs> so, I hope the coffee and, bar and, is still yeah. open. <laughs> and, and you are looking at me to solve this. <laughs> <laughs> and as a good Belgian guy, I will say yes and no. No, there is no resignation. 
<laughs> no, there is no resignation, because otherwise we won't have any workers anymore if it, everybody would resign. But there is great revaluation. What do I mean with this? It's because of the COVID, people have been away from, from the office. They, they have continued to work in a different way. They have continued to be very productive. And two years after, their employers have said, yeah, but you have to come back. And they have said, I have to come back. I have to come back in big cities. I have to commute again and so on. I don't want to do this. And as consequence of this, they have started to reevaluate their life. And they have said, no, I want another life. And I can give you also figures, because we are one of the biggest uh, recruiters in the world. If pre-pandemic, we had about 10% of the jobs opening which were allowed to be performed away from the office. Post-pandemic, we were above 70% of the jobs being able to perform in a remote way. And this has changed dramatically. And the employers who were not allowing that kind of work pattern, they have lost, they have lost their employees. So that's why this great revaluation. The revaluation, Governor, you, I mean, it's slightly more difficult in the state sector, in the sense, in the public sector, um, to, to do that. Uh, but we'll come on to policies that you might introduce. But if you just look at your state employees that you have, did you see any shifts and changes? Well, first of all, I would agree with my friend from Belgium saying <laughs> yes and no. Um, and we had some people, I think, that reevaluated uh, what they wanted to do for a living during the 28 months that we've been going through COVID. Uh, maybe reevaluated what type of job they wanted to, to have. And we've been focused on a couple of things. One, with our state government employees, we evaluate, we were having difficulty filling all of the jobs. People that did, we did have some folks leave and go into higher paying private sector jobs. Um, we, we, we initiated an effort where we took about 20,000 of our state government jobs and we lowered the requirements. We let, let them transfer, instead of requiring a four year uh, degree, uh, we allowed for people that had you know, comparable work experience or served in the military or had other real world, real life experience. So we enabled a whole lot of new people to now be able to apply. They were perfectly capable of doing the jobs. They were just being excluded. Um, but, now, did uh, you do that because there was a necessity? You couldn't fill the jobs. Therefore, necessity being the mother of invention, you had to change the criteria. Well, it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, so I, we're growing jobs at twice the rate of the rest of the country. Uh, unemployment is down. Um, our state government jobs, it was not big, that big of an issue, but a big portion of our workforce, we have the highest median household income in America and the most highly educated workforce, but we also have a huge chunk of folks that were kind of being left on the sideline. And so we wanted to try to provide more opportunities for them, both in state government and to provide, you know, trying to set an example for the private sector to say, maybe you should consider uh, the requirements that you have for some of the positions you're trying to fill. We've got a fair number of people in the room. Has anybody changed job in the last 12 months? Yes, ma'am, you, you change jobs uh, by your own choice. Yep. You resigned from one and you went off to the next. Yes, I did. Excellent. And behind you, the gentleman there. Same. I changed jobs. I resigned from one and went to the next. I, I mean, it's not a personal question, which it is a personal question. Um, what, were, what was the motivation for, for resigning to go? Well, I guess, I'll rephrase that in case it might be other personal. Was it because quality of life, other issues like that? No. No, my tenure was over in one job. It was actually two years passed over. All right. And I had a successor and I was in her way and I left. Anyone on this side change jobs? What about you? Yes, tell us. Um, a shout. <laughs> I changed jobs ten and a half months ago. Mm -hmm. And a small part of my rationale was related to the fact that my former employer wanted people back in the office with a higher degree of regularity, and my current employer is a virtual first environment. That was not the only reason, sure. but that was a small part of the reason. Right, and I, I won't call anybody to justify it, but has anybody considered changing jobs? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> When's your term up, Governor? I think others might have a view on that. In January, I'm going to be part of the Great Resignation. Yeah. Uh, my term will come to an end. Oh, there we go. And at the end of June, I will, be, I will make a great revelation. And at the end of November, I'm stepping down from my current job. <laughs> So, essentially, we have a panel <laughs> on a discussion that, that doesn't exist with people who won't be in work. <laughs> well, no, in different work. Oh, in yeah. different work. Right. But, Hopefully but we'll listen, find a job. Yeah, but, can I, can I yeah. break the myth, the second part of the myth here? There are jobs, including many of my own staff, who do have the luxury to have some, you know, work for, working from home with technology, etc. Not entirely, because... They represent workers globally, so they have to go to where the workers are or where the negotiations are. But that's a luxury. In hospitality, in retail, can you really serve a customer on the, you know, in a, in a street souping yeah, in Davos down the road if you're not there? In meat processing factories, in factories that kept us going, in the health environment, in teaching, yes, for a while, but do we... In fact, the parents in my staff thought teachers were heroes by the end of the time because they wanted to get their kids back to school. But as, uh, as the General Secretary of, the, of a trade union confederation, is this turnover, for whatever reason, is this beneficial because employers have to do more to attract staff? They have to work harder to do that. Yeah, I mean, we can use it. There's no doubt about that. I was saying to the governor that wages in his state, not quite 15, but they're 12 50 or something, minimum wages. But when I looked at the statistics, people actually... There's a lot of exemptions. A lot of them are paid lower wages in hospitality, in retail, in leisure, in other areas where you have to be present. And they're moving. P PricewaterhouseCoopers figures, actually, are enlightening because they say that there was less job swapping even last year mm -hmm. than previously. And I think that is about security. But also, remember, you had, I don't know, the American market had an extraordinary loss of workers to the labour market, majority of them women, because women couldn't afford health care, um, child care. They actually now are really feeling the, the, the pinch financially. But going back to work is a cost benefit calculation? Look, I think we, uh, we've we been focused on this issue for the eight years that I've been governor of Maryland, and it's really about kind of upskilling and reskilling workers and, and trying to train them for the jobs of the future and, and, and allow them to earn higher income. So we have a number of different programs. We start in the high schools with a thing called P-TECH, where we focus on STEM. We let them get a two-year AA degree at the same time they get their high school diploma. They get, their, they get paid summer internships and mentorships and first in line for jobs when they come out. Uh, we've got a program we started called the Earn Grant Program. It's nationally recognized where we will pay for with grants. Uh, the private sector designs the training that they need for the skilled jobs that they have, and we, we do this through our community colleges. Uh, but the state will pay for this to help. We don't want to train workers for the jobs that there's no market for. Mm -hmm. We want to train them for these very specific skills that, that all of you in the private sector need. And we, we've added 60 different new apprenticeships, uh, including not just the traditional thing like the trades, but in things like cybersecurity, where we have, we're the cyber capital of America, home to the NSA and the US Cyber Command. We have 17 colleges and universities of cyber excellence, but we're reskilling folks that didn't actually get a college degree that are coming out and making $100,000 a year. Uh, so, you know, trying to provide for the jobs of the future, the government does have a really big role to play in partnership <laughs> with the private sector too. But the number one problem we hear from every industry is we don't, it's not a question of people leaving their jobs, it's a question, we don't have enough skilled uh, labor to do what we need to do. But the US is having to do quite a bit of catch up yeah. on that, isn't it? Uh, in terms of the, the, the re, not just the reskilling. They to do a, they're but, doing but, a lot of catch up to Maryland, you mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah they are. Yeah. I'll allow you that, Governor. I'll allow you that. <laughs> no, uh, uh, perhaps a, a few thoughts about it, because it's also about. Again, this revaluation, you have a lot of people having left a company and an industry because this, camp, this industry was eventually low paid, heavy duty, you had to work during the weekend, in the shift, and during the night, and so on. 
and during the COVID, they have discovered new type of jobs and they have left. They have left the hospitality, for example. Now, the question is, do the employers have to work harder? Not really harder, but for sure they have to reinvent themselves and re reinvent them bu their business. And so that's why you see a lot of restaurants saying, OK, we open earlier, but we finish also earlier so that people can have at least a normal life, a normal night. They, they close eventually the Saturday evening so that the people can have their weekend. And so they, they reinvent themselves also to offer a better life for, for the people. Sir. Uh, of course, we need to take some measures, but uh, as the group, we have always adopted a long-term perspective, including this one. Our main strength com comes from our values, core values, which have been embedded in our corporate culture, including putting the people first. That means, uh, from the job protection point of view, we have always stood by our colleague, our people, even during very difficult times, including the COVID, COVID period. And having said that, job security is not enough. New generations have different expectations. They want to uh, put a positive impact in the societies they, they live in. They want to make a change for the better. So they want to be empowered and included. Right. In order for us to enable them to do so, we have had to adapt uh, new me, methods. Tell me what you've adapted, because we're talking here about a, a sort of a, a late, what well, Gen Z or late Gen X workforce, which I don't think there's anybody in the room who might be Gen Z. <laughs> um, but we're talking about a workforce that that requires that what are you what are you amending first of all they want flexibility they they want flexibility in time and place uh, as we have uh, discussed they don't like hierarchical structures so we have decided to adopt this agile working model which is quite instrumental uh, to remove hierarchical structures and empower our colleagues. We have also included, uh, uh, adopted new uh, personalized hybrid uh, working uh, schemes for our colleagues. We have now uh, built 35 collective office spaces where they can work when they need to come to work physically. And we are planning to increase it up to 100 uh, units. Therefore, in, in addition to complement this, uh, we have had to adopt a new performance uh, system which provides transparency of the company objectives, also the goals of the uh, uh, top right. management. Now, Alain, maybe we can go work for him. Please. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, but I, I'm so pleased with all purpose. And, and I think today everything is starting with the purpose. And, and young people, and especially the, the Gen Z, they are looking for strong purpose, allowing them to have impact, to make impact into the society. But, but I take the or example to make the future work for everyone. Everybody wants to make the future work for everyone. A and it starts by having this purpose and then, yes, you have the different benefits, flexibility, because it, it, it is very important, but you have to demonstrate in real fact, in, in, with real facts how you embody your purpose so that people are willing to join you and stay with you. But let me take you to Nigeria, Tunisia, you know, India, pick a country, Indonesia. The young Gen, Gen C, in fact, anybody that's younger than us, <laughs> is still actually pretty desperate for job security, yeah. for yeah. a labour market place where they can feel like they can feed their families, live with dignity, you know. But, but Sharon, that's merely a, 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 a point that one size doesn't fit all. The policies have to account for those markets that are less developed and have more basic... That's about the... jobs and decent work. Right, yeah, but... versus those in the, develop... in the developed world where there are more... Uh, h higher, if you like, at the scale It might mean that the companies with the luxury to actually do good in the world actually put in place human and labour rights in their supply chains. Yeah. But Maybe yeah. mandated due diligence, Richard. The one doesn't prevent the other. I think 
Strong purpose, yes, I know, security and flexibility. A and we are advocate of combining flexibility, which is requested by the young generation. They want to, to have the possibility to move on very regularly, but they, they want also to have security. And so it's up to us, and especially I'm looking at the pos policy makers, uh, to organize this combination of security and, and flexibility, both on the individual side, but also for the companies, for the business to be allowed to do that. As a policy maker, how do you balance the legislative or regulatory environment between job security and um, the, uh, the, the freedom of the workforce and the, the availability of the workforce? Well, it's the freedom of the workforce and freedom for the, you know, the, pr the private sector companies that get to make these decisions for themselves. So you want to set policies that help people uh, get the skills and get the jobs that they want and to have a purpose and to have the flexibility and all the things that the, this generation is looking for without being, uh, you know, dictating to companies what they have to do because I think it, look, this was, this was going to happen anyway. It's been accelerated because of COVID and it, it's different industries are impacted. So we were talking about the service industry. You can't do that remotely. Uh, there's certainly a lot of, you know, things in, in, in IT where you don't have to ever come to work. You can do everything remotely. Somewhere in between, I think, in the service industries, like in law firms or financial services, I think younger people who are not working in the office are losing uh, that mentorship of yeah. the older generation, you know, that aren't Gen Z, that can pass on to them by working together in an office. So I think, I think we've got to, we all have to figure out in each industry, in each sector, in each, each level of, of, of income, uh, you know, how we're going to go about this new world of, of uh, work. But listening to what Levent was saying about, how, how old's your company? Uh, in four years, we will be celebrating our centennial. Oh, we're all ah. invited ah. to the party. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So you're 100 years old. Yes. Um, and it's a family, it's, a, it's quite listed, one of the largest companies in Turkey, listed but family for fraud. You know, how easy was it for you to make that mental adjustment for a, a, a traditional company that recognised it had to do things differently? The, the image I always have is our parents disco dancing uh, until one realizes that's now us uh, 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 at a certain age. So how easy was it for you <laughs> to make that adjustment? First of all, let me say that uh, uh, publicly listed company but family controlled gives me the comfort to maintain this long-term perspective. Uh, I have never been under short-term uh, performance pressure at all. That's why during difficult times, I have the luxury of making these tough decisions. And I have to say that when we make the tough decisions, in turn, our colleagues act in solidarity to support their companies when we needed their support. And uh, this has been part of our cultural transformation journey, all what we have done. Uh, it is our responsibility as the management of this wonderful group, which I'm very proud of working for, to prepare this group for the next century. In order for us to do that, we have been running a transformation program and the main pillars of this program are digital transformation, zero-based approach, innovation, corporate entrepreneurship, agile working, carbon transition and people development. This is part of this big overarching transformational program. What's the one thing that people want? That, that people have you've told you from your, because you've, you, you know, you've, not only, you've only got thousands of employees yourself, but you've got two million people that you place. So what is the one thing besides a, a, a decent salary? The one thing is impact. What does if, that mean? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Every time we are uh, meeting, interviewing people, and we are asking them, so yeah, but, and I speak about the Gen Z, what do you want? I want to have impact. And you have to help them to answer the, the question, what kind of impact? And, and afterwards, you have to give them the opportunity and the possibility to have a, first a small impact and then a bigger impact and so on. But the key question they have and the key ambition they have is having, making and having impact. I do wonder, perhaps somewhat more controversially, when we all started in our careers, you knew it was more than five days a week that you'd be working. You knew 
that it would be long hours. If you were going to climb to the top of the greasy pole in any profession, you knew that this was going to require uh, a, a commitment and level of dedication, and certainly in politics, it's not nine to five. No, it's not nine to five. Yeah, I spent my whole life in the private sector as an entrepreneur, starting and you know, founding and running small businesses. And uh, you know, talk about you know wanting a purpose. You know, I, I left forty years in private sector for the first time ever to run for office because I was searching for a purpose, how I could make a difference for the people in my state. And I work you know seven days a week around the clock, but I'm passionate about what I do and I love my job. And I think that really is what everyone. Right, wants. but when you and we've talked a lot about Gen Z. But you know there, that's only a small. That's only a portion of the yeah. issue. We we have uh, folks at middle age and older who need to get reskilled re because they still want to contribute and they're not kind of able to because they don't have the skills that they need. I was coming to reskilling in a second. Like me, I didn't have any skills to be governor, but I learned yeah. on the job. <laughs> and you got reelected. <laughs> yeah, I got reelected. So clearly, the voters thought you might have had some skills. <laughs> No, well, well, we are coming from a total, total different background. I think uh, 40, 30, 35 years ago, when we started to, to work where I was coming from, it was about earning money, being able to pay my apartment, my cars in an autonomous way and so on. This generation is coming from a total different environment. Sure. The, the, but when I the started as a junior different. reporter, when I started as a junior reporter, the idea of wondering that you hadn't had a weekend off. Now, I'm not saying it's right, Sharon, because I can feel you bristling. Absolutely. <laughs> I can feel you bristling. I'm not yeah. saying it's right. But I hear some of the questions or the issues now, and I think, you know, you know, how things have changed. Yeah, absolutely. The environment has changed, and, and they say, yeah, but career is not anymore the top of my priority. Uh, I, I want for sure to, have in, to live in a secure environment and so on, but I don't want to give any more everything for my professional career. I want a balance. The vast majority of the people want a balance between private purpose and, and professional purpose, and they are not ready to, to any compromise. But I think you're talking about a particular work culture. You know, my father was a builder. He went to work at 7 o'clock in the morning, he was home at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, religious, every day of his life. You know, he would then go out and do things in the community. My brother worked for a, for a public sector. He went to work every day, came home every day at the same time. That's the bulk of the workforce. I'm sorry, but it is. And the number one convention, the number one convention at the ILO in terms of global rights is actually working time. The good old eight hours, eight hours, eight hours. Now, when we re-evaluated the future of work in 2019 and negotiated with employers and with governments, they said irrespective of the employment arrangements, because we are seeing a terrible breakdown in the employment contract, 60% informal work, total exploitation, desperation in many countries, no social protection, no minimum wages, no rule of law, and of the 40%, 30% of those people are insecure. So, yes, they want a decent wage, but I'd say the one thing they want is job security so they can do what you just said, pay their, their rent, invest in a car if that's what they want, raise a family. So I don't think we should romanticise the difference between some professions, absolutely acknowledge that, and the bulk of the world of work. Right, but has the bulk of the world of work changed? No, and not great, dramatically. Right, and, and I mean, the myth of what we're talking about, the great resignation, is those privileged ones who are who enjoy the luxury. No, I don't think that's true either. You, you have to separate the luxury of saying, I'm going to negotiate to work from home mm -hmm. for three days or five days. Yes, we all have employees and many of ourselves who make that choice. But if you walk the world I walk in the global workforce, then the overwhelming number of people work a set number of hours in a set location. Half the world's not even connected to the internet when you want to talk about remote working. So I just think in a, in a world that wants to be global, in, where companies have supply chains, you have to understand the whole of the workforce and not just this bit, as much as I'm not saying we shouldn't actually manage it well. I have no figures, but I think that the profile of the workforce has changed. And probably 40 years ago, we should look at the figures. But you have many more people having the, 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 the type of working life you are describing, on-premise, very regulated, quite many more manufacturing jobs and so on. And through the years, 
uh, we have automated a lot. So we have created a lot of new jobs. So it means that today, when you look at the global workforce, 50% needs to be on-premise, but 50% are the so-called knowledge workers. 50%, and those 50%, they, are, they have older expectations today than they could have uh, 30, right, so, 30 years ago. So you're talking about that 50% on the knowledge-based workforce? Absolutely. That is, that, that, that is shifted. To that extent, how, where do you draw the line, Levant? What, where will you move no further? When, where, you know, in, in terms of, I'll do flexible working, I'll do this, I'll do that, but at what point do you say, enough's enough? You want to work for us, these are the criteria that you've got to follow. Uh, as, as a matter of uh, fact, uh, we talked about uh, the uh, purpose. I, I believe that the core values and the clear corporate strategy could uh, provide the sense of purpose to entire workforce, including the colleagues who are at the uh, shop floor operating the uh, machines. Having said that, uh, what we are doing has not been forced by uh, our employees or other forces to do. Uh, from our core, we put our people uh, f the first. Right. Therefore, it is, we believe that, that they are the ones who make us successful. Therefore, uh, I mean, uh, they, this is a dynamic relationship. I cannot tell you that this is the limit. We cannot go beyond. To your previous question, uh, what uh, was the uh, trigger maybe to make these type of changes? It was the COVID environment. Uh, I, I have to tell you, before COVID, we had thought about uh, remote working, more flexible working, but we didn't have the courage to do so. Having gone through that period, we saw that it, it was possible, it is possible, and we can test uh, the uh, limits of that. And we saw the results. We haven't lost any efficiency, operational efficiency by remote working. And we have the tools developed to measure the performances. Therefore, I mean, this is a dynamic uh, situation. I don't want to say uh, any uh, boundaries uh, that we have in our, our mind. Uh, I believe that whenever we need the support of each other from right. the colleagues, uh, from us as the manager, uh, they will be there, we will be there to support them. That is the main idea going forward. Let's hear from anybody in the room on this subject. Oh, that was quick, right in front of me. Uh, let's see who, who's going to want to speak. Your lady over there, lady over there, anybody behind me? Okay. Well, we'll start with you again, Matt. Thank you very much. I am Luisa. I work for BBVA, a bank. And obviously, we, we have felt the, the same issues as you've been describing. My question is on the longer term, because we have I I installed um, a hybrid model that has been formalized labor-wise. So it's a 60-40 model, very flexible in terms of how you can take it, right? My question is... 60-40 meaning? 60-40 on-prem. 40% remote. <coughs> There's obviously flexibility around that, but it, because it's, uh, it, it affects labor contracts, especially in Spain, that has to be sort of the, the rule, let's say. Right. So my point is, I feel sometimes that we're stuck between a rock and a hard place in the sense that remoteness creates less engagement overall, right? And so what happens is, aren't we going to a place where people are more disengaged overall from you know, the culture, the values, because they don't live it? And because they don't live it, they're going to be more right. volatile and they're going to move around more. So isn't this a catch-22? It is. We'll talk about that because what I found during the pandemic is the more junior staff were the first ones to want to work from home because it was such, you know, great in your gym jams. But as it went on longer and longer they realised they were the ones that were most at risk in terms of just being... A, you know, the senior staff were speaking to... We'd known each other for 20 years. We were speaking to each other every day, all the day, with, uh, on that. But the junior staff were not hearing the projects. They weren't getting water cooler time just by seeing that or popping into somebody's office. Or They felt disengaged. 
and they were the ones who were looking, wanting to come back into the office, but not all the time. So how do you balance that, Governor? How do you balance what we're saying? The need to come in with the risk of disengagement. Well, it's a really uh, difficult question. And as you said, it's a catch-22. I think it really is. And I think the people who suffer the most are the younger workers. I mentioned that earlier where I said they're not getting the mentorship of the folks that have been working for a long time. And you don't have that. There's a difference between being on, on a computer and interacting in a personal way in, in, together in the same office. Uh, so it, with, with our workers in the state government, uh, there's really different people that do different types of jobs. And some of them have to be there to do their job. It's like they're fixing a road, they're, they're building something, they're, you know, deal, they have to be engaged. You can't do it from a computer. There are other people, at, at, in, depending on what their job is, some customer service, answering phones, helping people with problems and steering them. They can do it remotely, but they still are not getting the interaction. And so with people at higher levels are all in there interacting every day and making big decisions. And it, it may be those folks in the middle that are yeah, really but, getting squeezed but, a little bit because they kind of... Uh, okay. they're, they're being remote, and they thought it was going to be good for them, but they're starting to find that it, it's right, actually hurting them. Can I just t take you on this? Because for those people who have to be there, <laughs> and in our business it's the directors, it's the producers, it's the people who put the programmes out, the, the cameramen, all that sort of people, do you feel, or in your case, the road workers, or the, the people who, do, who are doing that, do you feel the need to somehow in some way compensate either with greater leave or by finding some flex work for the fact that they have to go to work versus other people who don't? Well, what we've, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, what we've tried to do is have, give people a path upward. And so the folks that were at this level are now making more money. And we've backfilled with people by, lo by saying you don't have to have a four-year degree to do these jobs. And we brought in new people who are excited to have those jobs and who are working hard. And so it's been a win-win for both the the uh, people that have been with us a while and with the, the new folks that have now have an opportunity. But Richard, you make it sound like the workplace is a terrible thing. No, like, I don't. I don't. Like, the, the it's actually a place that Depends most of us like to be. We no. like our colleagues. Oh, yeah. And Spain actually moved very quickly to put legislation in place to protect workers and the dignity of decent work in that mix. No, I'm, so, I, 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 then if I've given that impression, I didn't mean to. I, I was intending to point out, if I, again, if I think of our industry, where mine is, you know, we ended up giving a bonus to those producers who, throughout the pandemic, had to come into the office because you had to keep the programme on air. And it was a way of recognising that there were people who didn't have a choice. Nobody gave the nurses or the retail workers or the truck drivers bonuses. Well, that's a, but that's not a reason not... But with great respect, no. Sharon, that is not a reason not to do it where you can. No, no, no. And I totally agree with that. You know I do. But I actually do think we need to also know the nature... If you put people first and you know the nature of the job and people tell you that they're engaged, that they want to be working in this way, that's fine. Work it out. But don't think that we know what people want because mental health's gone through the roof in terms of risk. You know, some people have now got eye conditions, the blue light. Other people, uh, you know, are, are actually risking right. hearing. We'll take a question. Anybody else want a question? Hi, uh, my name is Salome. I'm a global shaper and I'm a millennial. <laughs> Um, so I work for a university, so I also with like the Gen Z and employability. Yep. So I wanted to comment on what uh, Sharon said earlier about developing countries not also wanting the flexibility and the rest because they are more into job security. So the truth is they are already even having a cap of how long they are going to sacrifice that flexibility to save and still want right. like what you would call the developed uh, countries want the flexibility and agility. So still, regardless if they're in developed or developing, they're still wanting what they want, which is, as she said, passion, impact, um, doing so many things in the world. So, yeah, I wanted to make comments on that. Gentleman behind. Hi, uh, my name is Pranav, CEO of EI MindSpark. I find that a lot of the employees today want to work less, uh, but want continuously higher increases in pay, and they're also the competition is poaching them. How does one sort of uh, you know balance out the need for creating value first before uh, capturing it from an employee lens? Um, they want the work-life balance, but they also want a 20% pay. 
Uh, and as a business, it's hard. Right, but that's value. entirely reasonable. Yeah, that sounds I mean, good to me. You know, if you only have, if you're an employee, you only have one thing to sell, which is you. And if you can sell that for 20% more and still get satisfaction, what's your problem with that? <clears throat> Running a profitable business. Oh, uh, good point. Yes, uh, the lady next to you, I think, was the Hi, um, I'm Penny Noss. I'm with UPS. Oh. So, a uh, question, question I wanted to ask was about roles of leaders and managers, because what we're talking about so far is the workers. But when you're talking about disengagement, when you're talking about things, one of the things that we've seen is, you know, during the crisis, that locational bias of the headquarters uh, was lessened because you had to work globally with everybody and everybody's square was the same size. And so my question is, is this a worker problem or is this a leader problem? Sir, worker or leader problem? Uh, uh, I, I think this, this is a leader problem to make sure that uh, all the uh, workforce uh, have been engaged in the uh, common uh, purpose and objectives. Uh, so, when it comes to uh, changing role of the uh, leaders, uh, what the pandemic have uh, strengthened uh, the need for the leaders to be close to the uh, colleagues as much as they can. They need to improve their communication, coordination skills, especially for the ones who are working remotely. And there are tools, uh, if, if we have time, I can... Regretfully, we don't, sir. <laughs> but we'll continue. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I'm Andre Guay. I'm an oncologist in the US running a large multi uh, center cancer program and we all obviously dealt with COVID. You talk about nurses, thank you for mentioning them because in this post-COVID environment, they're the one who saved the world. Mm -hmm. And they very often say that we went from heroes to zeros, well you heard that multiple times, sure. Um, we hired, uh, during the peak of the pandemic, over 3,500 nurses, over 4,000 actually, nurses from these traveling nurses from agencies that are a much higher cost. And actually, we have employees now that are leaving departments, working temporarily for these companies and coming back in the same department with a salary that is almost double. So this is really difficult to manage as a hospital. And I would like to get a, um, a comments and question for the panel, particularly you, Governor, is that any feedback or initiatives that were done in healthcare where it's an industry that doesn't have a huge margin under pressure post COVID recovery and how we keep the staff in, in healthcare setting. It's, it's a really uh, important and difficult uh, question, hard to answer. I don't have a, a real easy one for you, but I agree that the nurses were the healthcare heroes throughout the pandemic. And uh, you know, our state had one of the best uh, health responses to the pandemic of any place in America. And I was leading the National Governors Association as the governors were leading through that. I can. I tell you that the nurses were doing an incredible job. The whole healthcare system stepped up, and uh, we owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude. But we were seeing, you know, there were, as the pandemic uh, went regionally from one place to another, there were places that desperately needed nurses, and they were willing to pay huge amounts of money to get visiting nurses. You know, they were, in some cases, doubling their pay. So we were having an exodus of nurses leaving. It got to the point in our state where we have a huge, very, you know, great uh, healthcare system. We had people from Johns Hopkins across the street from the University of Maryland medical system. They would move across the street to get more money. So we had this people just transferring all over the place. It was like the, the you know, the highest bidder. And on the one hand, it was the, the nurses were desperately needed, and they paying them more was was something you had to do. But the margins are very slim, and they were actually competing against each other. The hospital systems. But we need to invest much more in care. Yeah. If the global health shock did nothing else, it exposed the underinvestment no in care globally. And if we don't pay attention, to that it is health. It is education, it's childcare, it's aged care, it's all of those things. If you want to keep people in the labour force, in, you've got to provide health care, but you also have to provide those other areas of care. But the, the solution is bargain for higher wages. You know, nurses have been underpaid in many countries forever. I used to bargain for worker nurses alongside their union in Australia, and I can tell you the skills levels for those nurses are extraordinary they could actually earn money right up to nurse practitioner, just below a doctor. Doctors didn't particularly like it, but there are solutions for careers that make people want to stay. And I think it's time we evaluated who we are actually valuing and what we are paying them. And I just say, can I just say to the young woman over here that 
I'm talking about the jobs availability because young people in Tunisia right now are again, you know, on the streets because they can't get jobs. You know, in many parts of the world, they can't get jobs. So it isn't about the luxury of, of exactly what you say. I'm not suggesting for a minute they don't have the same value set. But the first priority is to get a job, to get a job that pays them decently and that has some security. As we come to the end, because I can see we are just about out, my last... OK, yeah. no, I would like to say to this oh. young, great woman, don't bargain security for flexibility, but leapfrog. That's also the opportunity you have. And, and, and you should claim for more flexibility and, and to realize your dream, to have impact and so on. And at the same time, if in, in, invent a way to also have security. And there are ways to do it. It's just that society and, 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 and policy and regulation have to be reinvented according to right. the need of the current society. Finally, you talked about the great re-evaluation. Right? You said re-evaluation. So, to the panel, finally, how have you re-evaluated your own life? And what are you going to do differently? What has your re-evaluation led you to conclude about your own life, sir? Uh, I, I have realised that I have been working uh, very hard. I'm, Personally, I am trying to uh, balance my life uh, again, but uh, we have seen uh, that even during very difficult times, we have to keep our hopes alive. That is my lesson. Sharon, what have you reevaluated? I think we've got. Not we. No, you. no, but me in my role have gone back to basics. We have to fight, and that means me, but it means all of you, for full employment and social protection. That's at the heart of trust in our future. Now, the way we work is a different story. What are you going to do differently in your life as a result of what's happened? Your personal re-evaluation? Uh, I'll have to think about that. <laughs> Sorry? What am I going to do? I, t I tell you what I'm going to do. Having done 21 years at CNN, I'm entitled to a month's long service leave, which I probably wouldn't have taken. <laughs> and now, to hell with the lot of you, I am <laughs> off for the whole of July. Your re-evaluation. My revelation, I want to stay young and join the young, the Gen Z generation and have impact in the new chapter of my life. Governor, are you going to put the sordid business of politics behind you? <laughs> well, somebody's got to save politics, so I'm going to continue <laughs> to try to be a voice of reason and bipartisan cooperation. But, uh, yeah, I think I've learned I, from the younger people we're talking about, I would love to have some work-life balance. I, oh, I, I, I took two days off and went to Davos. That was my only to, to take care <laughs> right. of. I leave you with this thought. <laughs> the level of hypocrisy <laughs> on work-life balance that you have heard today, well, I'll leave you to make your own judgments. Thank you. <laughs>